Kalabani, welcome. My name's Ian Campbell from Palliative Care Australia in Canberra on the lands of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples. Welcome to Thursdays at Three, our regular series of conversations with people living and working at the end of life. A special episode today looking at the role pharmacists play in our health and well-being. Last week, our friends at the Pharmaceutical Society of Australia launched a new partnership with the PALS program, which stands for Pharmacy Addressing Loneliness and Social Isolation. This free program for PSA members is designed to equip pharmacists to understand loneliness and improve the health of their local community. PSA is also leading one of the national palliative care projects, the Palliative Care Foundation Training Program, which is working towards upskilling pharmacists with the foundational knowledge, skills and compassion needed to provide palliative care support to their patients. The two people behind all this good work join us today for Thursdays at three. Jenny Kirshner has over 20 years experience in the healthcare and pharmacy sector and is the founder of the PALS program. Hello, Jenny. Hi, everybody. Nice to be here today. And Leah Robinson is the project manager with the Pharmaceutical Society of Australia and one of the heads, hearts and hands involved in the palliative care training for pharmacy. Good day, Leah. Thanks for your time today. Hi, Ian. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Jenny, let's start with you, given that the PALS program was just launched last week at the PSA conference. Uh, I love a clever acronym, and you've definitely got one with PALS, which, as I said, stands for Pharmacy Addressing Loneliness and Social Isolation. Tell us about the PALS program. Sure. So the PALS program is actually a world-first pharmacist training program on loneliness, and that's pretty special to think about the fact that globally we don't have a dedicated training for pharmacists or health professionals addressing loneliness. So this was really inspired actually by my own experiences of loneliness in my 20s and 30s. And it was something that I, it was a very painful experience for me, but like with a lot of people with loneliness, there's a stigma and there's a shame and I hid it well. So nobody would know that I was lonely. It was a very internal experience, but it was very painful. And so for many years, I thought I need to do something about this but because I was so identified with the shame and stigma, I, it wasn't the right time. COVID happened and I realised, you know, what? There's, there's an opportunity here to talk about loneliness. There's a little crack. There's a moment where we could transform conversations. And so yeah. then what I started to do was reach out to world leaders, including the World Health Organisation, and said, hey, I'm, I'm creating a training program for pharmacists. Would you be happy to be interviewed and part of that program? And I started to get yeses. So then I spent the last um, you know, year or so crafting a, a, a program that's specifically for pharmacists and has expert interviews from world leaders who are professors and otherwise leading you know, social connection and loneliness researchers, as well as utilising pharmacists, so peer interviews, so really making sure it's got that co-design element, also ensuring it's got the lived experience element and... and um, you know, sharing those stories and then we really target what can pharmacists do at a patient level, a pharmacy level and community level, so making it practical and implementable, but also we look at loneliness within the pharmacy community and the pharmacy profession. So I'm very excited and thrilled to partner with the PSA to bring this to Australian pharmacists um, and so far the feedback has been just astonishing, beautiful. People are really, it's like we've given permission for the pharmacy community to lean into this and to put the hand up and say, yes, I want to be a part of it. Jenny, you've blown my mind a, a little bit because I, I sort of had the assumption that this was about um, loneliness within a, a community that was being serviced by a, a pharmacist rather than thinking that pharmacists were experiencing loneliness themselves but based on, on, on your experience, that's very much the, the inspiration for the program in a lot of ways, your own experience, your own feelings of loneliness as a pharmacist. Yes. And I think it's not just pharmacists. A lot of professions, actually workplace loneliness is rampant around Australia and globally, yeah. but there are certain health professional careers that are a high stress, a lot of responsibility, and that can breed that sense of loneliness depending on the workplace and the workplace culture. 
<laughs> Jenny, where does that come from, do you think? I mean, uh, pharmacy is such a, a front-facing, community-facing job. And people might be surprised to hear that loneliness is 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 a feeling that can can come up in that in that space when you're interacting with, you know, your your own pharmacy team and the community. Where does loneliness come from in in that sort of environment? It's a great question. I think it's important to start with differentiating loneliness from social isolation, and I'll take us through okay. that. You can be in a room full of people or in a pharmacy full of community and still feel lonely. Right? And conversely, you could be alone and feel totally fine. So loneliness is a really subjective feeling. So if I feel lonely, then I am lonely. Compared to the number of people you might be around, if you're not around a lot of people, you might be isolated. So that's an objective number of people you might be around. So you, so you make a good point. You're in a pharmacy all day. There's lots of people coming in and out. But if you think about the pharmacist role, you're giving a lot to other people. It's very busy. You might have stresses that the other staff members don't have, depending on, you know, who else is in the pharmacy. And you often are not talking about yourself. You're often not being seen for who you are and what's important to you yeah, right. because you're there giving to lots of other people. And that discussion about, you know, yourself is not necessarily um, being addressed. Having said that, I think for pharmacists like for myself, I tend to take a different approach and I've always kind of gone around the counter, sat on the bench with someone or on the seat and had a chat with them and I have been vulnerable. So if there is somebody, I mean, loneliness is complex, but if you as a health professional can own your vulnerabilities and be really honest about where you're at and potentially say to the patient, I'm having a bit of a crappy day, then you, there's, there's, there's landscape for connection in there connection comes from that authenticity yeah. but to, to come back to your question in a busy pharmacy with lots of responsibility with staff who might have different levels of um, stress that they're under you're often the empath giving to other people and there's no time mm -hmm. the other thing is pharmacists work on weekends and after hours and go in early where's the time to prioritize the call to your family or your call to your friend or going out you know after work some of those things again look this is complex it's a bit environmental and social and you know con context and personal but there's some of the factors that can influence the loneliness within the pharmacy workspace yeah thanks jenny i think we can all relate it's a very human experience feeling lonely in a in a crowded busy room i think we can all relate to that let's bring leah into this conversation leah the pals program was launched as as part of your conference in Sydney last week, what's been the response from, from members of the Pharmaceutical Society of Australia about the PALS program? Yeah, it's been incredible. We've had hundreds of pharmacists enrol in the program and uh, a lot complete it. The um, messages that are both coming through to Jen and myself, the feedback that's been done already in, in five days has been phenomenal. And I think, like Jenny said, it's almost a relief that it's destigmatizing this it's we can talk about it it's either I know someone that's lonely or I myself have felt this way and it, it has got a name and I know what it is and I know what to do um, but also it's going to influence their practice in their community and and so many have said now I know I'm going to apply these learnings to my practice in my community and and really try and make a difference um, for those that are experiencing loneliness Leah, you touched on the taboo of loneliness there, the stigma around loneliness there. And indeed, there's a bit of that with palliative care, a whole lot of that with palliative care and, and talking about death and dying. It, it carries that stigma, carries that taboo uh, as, as well. Is there a link there between the, the taboo of loneliness and the, and the stigma that comes with talking about, about death and dying? Are, are they connected, do you think? Yeah, absolutely. Jenny and I have spoken on this and I think that's why a lot of our work has aligned because there there is. And just by breaking it down and talking about it and talking and educating people um, starts to remove some of that stigma and people aren't as scared to talk about it or to talk about it with other people and know what to say, what not to say, how to approach it. But also when they do see that someone is lonely or, or palliative, to know then what to say or do to help connect with them. And, and as Jenny said, make it authentic. And it's such a human element to both of these areas. 
you know, we're not selling a product, we're not selling a service, we, we're selling, you know, being human and going through this, everyone's going to go through something at some point in their life with their family, themselves, their friends. Um, so I, I feel like just talking about it, but having educated conversations and, and knowledge to back it and the evidence that Jenny's talked to um, does make a huge difference in in clinical practice every day. So it doesn't matter what practice setting you're in, um, it's going to make a difference by being more aware of both of these and how to talk to it. Jenny, just thinking of your, I guess, your your pharmacy background and your your pharmacy training and the the impact of, of loneliness and these sorts of taboos and stigmas, you know, I I think the the mental health impact is is perhaps easy to under understand. But are there physical impacts as well or, or, or medical impacts that perhaps um, mess with the medication a, a, a pharmacist might be dispensing? So before I go there, I'm going to highlight something that you mentioned before, which was the fact that loneliness is really human and it's really common and it's just a, a normal human experience. What it is actually saying, it's a social pain. So much like hunger is... If you're hungry, you get a bit of a, a tummy that says, hey, I need some food. Or if you're thirsty, you go and grab a drink. Social pain or the feeling of loneliness is a bit of a pain, that, a, a signal that says, hey, you, your relationships aren't the quality that you want them to be or not as meaningful as you want them to be and you need to do something. And much like hunger and thirst, if you don't address them, if you don't address loneliness, it can have impacts on health. So I thought we need to set the, the context first to understand um, loneliness is not a mental health illness. It is not depression. It's a human experience. And there's a difference. You can feel low a little bit of time, which is that signal to go and, you know, take action toward greater connection. But if the loneliness doesn't resolve, if it continues, then that can have impacts on health. So just setting the, the context. Now let's turn yes. to the to the health impact. Loneliness affects mental health, physical health, cognitive health, and medication use. Right, which you spoke to. So things like, and I'm just going to name a few because there's, there's a lot available, but the one that stands out to me is a 26% increased risk of early death. Right, So being lonely increases your risk of early death by 26%. Wow. Stop. Right. <laughs> right. We've got a 20, and this is all evidence-based this is the latest research. These are the latest stats. 29% mm -hmm. increased risk of coronary heart disease, so heart disease. 32% increased risk of stroke. Increased risk of type 2 diabetes. Reduced immune system. High cholesterol, blood pressure. Right, and they go on. I'm also going to share now a couple of things about um, mental health. So the, the, the latest Suicide Prevention Australia report shows that loneliness is the third highest risk factor for loneliness, uh, for suicide in Australia, right? And, you know, third highest risk factor, that's that's significant. We also, I won't, I won't go into it all, but things like an association with um, dementia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease, these are the cognitive effects also, an increased incidence of depression and anxiety, though most of the research is around depression and that relationship there. So as you can see, significant health impacts. The good news is... That social engagement and social connection, good coach social connection is protective, right? So let's not have this as a totally bad story. There's a good side is that social connection is a protective effect on health, well-being and longevity. The PALS program gives pharmacists sort of practical steps to, to, to build that engagement, to, to, to yeah, build so those benefits that come, yeah? Yeah, so it takes the pharmacist through what they can do at a patient level, at a pharmacy level and at a community level. And I won't go through it all, but, um, you know, things like, and again, just referencing my notes. because Yeah, some examples would be easier. great. Just some, yeah. Yep. So a really basic example is having, educating the patient. So having flyers in your pharmacy about loneliness, and I'll just demonstrate uh, with the Pharmaceutical Society of Australia, we've created a consumer flyer education sheet. And so it takes you through what is loneliness, the different types, and some of the things you can do. So as a start, we can start to talk about it. 
then we can start to educate patients, which helps, you know, reduce all the stigma. And then we can do things like be involved in social prescribing, which is a movement gaining a lot of traction where health professionals and other community members can refer patients into community activities, volunteering activities, sewing, gardening clubs, whatever's of interest and meaningful to that person. These, there's a, as I said, there's a movement happening and pharmacists are starting to get involved in that space too. So I'll stop there. As Leah mentioned, there's screening. There's a lot of things we can do, but I would just start, we can start simple. Starting simple is recognising that loneliness is prevalent. One in three Australians experience loneliness, one in six mm -hmm. significant loneliness. And we need to start to talk about it like palliative care and like using the word death. We need to start to use these words as part of the human experience so then we can, you know, once someone can acknowledge that they're experiencing loneliness, they can take steps towards trying to address it. Leah, as you mentioned, uh, the response from your members has been really healthy, but I, I, I wonder if there's another, I guess, another sort of layer to this for us to talk about and, and would really welcome your input too, Jenny, around um, perhaps some reluctance for pharmacists to take on this, this sort of role in, in addressing loneliness and social isolation and, and addressing palliative care and, and stepping up into that palliative care work. You know, and, and look, I'm, I'm speaking in really general terms, but I imagine, you know, pharmacists are pharmacists because they want to dispense medicine and sell those fantastic jelly beans that you, you can only get in, in a pharmacy. But here we are asking pharmacists to do so much more than, than, than that. Some pharmacists might feel, look, I'm, thanks, Leah, thanks, Jenny, thanks, Ian, but I'm busy enough. I, I don't have the, the time or the resources to do this, this work. What would you say to that, that sort of attitude? Yeah, I think the, the response, um, yes, pharmacists are asked to do more and more in our healthcare system because they're so accessible. Um, they, the, the, the problem is a lot um, happy to be involved and, and I've never had anyone that wants to push back in palliative care and help their community in palliative care and the same with loneliness. They, they want to know about it. They want to know what to do. So they're happy to do the education, the hard work for us, um, particularly at the Pharmaceutical Society. And um, we've spoken with Jenny. Now we've launched this. The hard work really begins in, in pilots and um, community co-design in these programs and education and how we work at each community to um, fund these type of pilots and work. So how involved that the pharmacists can become so we can be aware of it and educate. But all of those extra um, services that they can provide or the screening tools or the support, they do need you know, funding models or uh, evaluation to see how we scale and sustain this kind of support. So the work that we do at the Pharmaceutical Society Australia is working with PHNs and states and communities and um, people that have experience in these models all over the country to work out how we make the most of it, how we cannot keep adding to that pharmacy workload, um, utilising their team. There's a whole workforce of pharmacy assistants that are incredibly skilled professionals. Um, we can really leverage off that workforce as well. So not only the 37,000 37, pharmacists, they have teams of pharmacy assistants mm -hmm. that are incredibly connected with their community and supporting a pharmacist every day. So I feel like there's a lot of work for us in the palliative care space, but there's also a lot in the loneliness space that we now have to do. And that's really where our work begins after the awareness and education. Jenny, do you have any wisdom here as a, as a, as a working pharmacist, um, at that sense of pharmacy being overwhelmed um, by the work already on their plate? And here we are asking them to, to do more. I second everything Leah said, which is yes, we very much acknowledge that the workforce is stretched and tired and burnt out and keep being asked to do more and more. But the flip side of that, I would say, is palliative care work and addressing loneliness often provides the meaning and the job satisfaction, right? So pharmacists do the dispensing, yes, yes, but if you ask any pharmacist what means something to them is those interact those meaningful interactions with patients being able to help somebody who's going through palliative care or their carer or their family that is you know the conversations are the things that give the job its satisfaction so you know yes 
everything that Leah said, we need to advocate and lobby and need funding to support these mm -hmm. because pharmacists are trusted, accessible and um, and yeah, they're just well positioned to address these. But I think you know there's a balance here. But this 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 fuels this fuels the job satisfaction. So thanks, Jenny. Leah, let's talk a bit more about um, your work in the palliative care space and the the palliative care foundation training that that you and the team at, at the Pharmacy Society of Australia are, are, are behind. Tell us a bit more about the the palliative care training you've got bubbling away. Yes, yeah, so as part of the National Grants Program um, with the department, we are building a foundation training program for pharmacists for palliative care. It will launch next May in 2025, and it's eight modules of online self-directed learning. It'll all be accredited for pharmacists. But basically, um, my colleague Megan and I really wanted to lift the, the profession, no matter what practice setting you're working in, to have a, a greater understanding of palliative care, how to involve palliative care, how to be involved in palliative care, no matter where you're working, and how to support and really focus on that person-centred care that palliative care does so well. Um, it's, again, removing the stigma, raising awareness, um, and, and just trying to lift the, the profession in what they can do. They can do the training and go on and do a whole lot more training, or they can just as Jenny said, be aware of it, have a conversation and do as little or as much as, as they aspire to do. Mm. Um, um, also, sorry, as part of that too, we will also be piloting six um, models of care of putting a pharmacist in different community practice settings um, as the second part of, of our project and that we are going to evaluate and, and really see how it's sustainable and scalable in Australia to have pharmacists out in the community helping people with, with medicines and, and supporting their carers and family in, in medication management and, and understanding through palliative care. And you're looking to, to launch all this uh, in Palliative Care Week, May 2025. It'll be yes. such a, a great resource for our, for our community. Yes. Leah, I'm wondering um, in different pockets of the, the health system, Doctors, nurses, other health professionals, are, 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 because they're human, are, are reluctant to talk about death and dying for, for all the reasons that we've touched on. Do you get that same sense from, from parts of the, the pharmacy community or are the pharmacy community a, a step ahead on this and perhaps more willing to, to go there when it comes to talking about death and dying and, and tackling these issues? Yeah, I think, you know, there's definitely a cohort that have led the way in this space and there's some amazing palliative care pharmacists in the country that really um, have done amazing work and we really look to those to be involved in, in the development of our education and our support. Um, on a whole, it is a little bit um, scary, uh, a bit tricky for pharmacists to get involved, especially at that community level where they are so busy and they don't have, you know, time that they can really connect yeah. and walk through these big conversations, but also knowing um, a lot of the feedback is knowing, you know, what do I say, what do I not say at different points in time? Um, and I think a lot of fear around saying the wrong thing. Um, they don't want to do that. And also a lack of understanding of what um, cis, kind of the resources and navigation in their local area for palliative care and is there specialist palliative care? Is it being done by the GP? How can I um, work with that team to provide support and education to that family. So that's something we're really working on is at different levels through palliative care, how the pharmacist can be, have an active role in, in helping them. Mm. Talking to you both, and, and you touched on it before, Jenny, that, that sort of central role of, a, a pharmacist plays in their community. And as I'm talking to you both, some memories are popping up from for me from from my childhood about our our local pharmacist uh, Kevin and Patsy grew at <laughs> at, at Sol Patterson in Thoreau in the northern suburbs of, of Wollongong and one of my first jobs was working for Kevin and Patsy grew in their pharmacy at, at Thoreau um, stocking shelves uh, folding brochures and then delivering brochures to to mailboxes I can't help but think you guys have got some great memories as well, either connected to, to your own work in pharmacy or or perhaps, you know, another pharmacist. Jenny, do you have any memories like that that, that sort of fill your, your tank? Yes, I wanted to share a story, so thank you for inviting that. 
and this is very relevant for the bridge between loneliness and palliative care. So my father's a pharmacist also, and I work in his pharmacy on the weekend. And we used to have a couple who would come into the pharmacy regularly and um, her name is Shirley and Shirley um, got diagnosed with cancer. So she started not to come in as frequently into the pharmacy and her husband would come in and we would chat with him and engage. And also our pharmacy took it on. I remember calling Shirley. You know, she wasn't coming in and I would just call on the weekends to just check in. It wasn't even about the medication, just to see how she was going. I even remember, you know, referring her to online services for support or people to reach out to about her, her emotional journey with, with, with her cancer. And this is very touching. I, I remember or my father told me a few weeks before Shirley died, um, she called you know, my father, just, just a regular pharmacist, and asked him if he would look after her husband when she passed away. So he wasn't lonely and so he was well looked after. Yeah. So pharmacists are doing a lot of this stuff anyway, are supporting the community <laughs> way beyond just dispensing medications. And, you know, in this particular example, you know, it's very fitting here in this conversation today, you know, um, the, the transitions and the life changes that can happen with palliative care for, for carers and, and family um, and the, the importance of pharmacist connection with the family as, some, you know, as the whole family goes through that journey and the loneliness can come, you know, from the carer role to losing, to, to, to bereavement, to losing somebody. And, um, yeah, I just thought it's, it's important to, like you said, share the stories um, and mm. know that pharmacists are doing magical things every day to help their community yep. and it goes beyond dispensing medication. It's a great example, Jenny. It points to the impact that, that pharmacy can have and, and is having. What about you, Leah? You come at this with a with with skin in the game from a couple of different angles. You've you've worked in pharmacy, you work for the Pharmaceutical Society of Australia. And what inspires your work in palliative care comes from your your mum's experience and your family's experience with with your mum's palliative care journey. Is there a story for you that, that sums this up? Yeah, I, I have many memories similar to Jenny of supporting the community um, back in my very early years um, in pharmacy in Sydney and, and the locals that would we would watch loose partners and, and come in for that that connection and we valued it just as much as, as they did, I think. And we noticed when they when they did pass away as well. But for my mum's journey, um in 2020 when she was diagnosed with brain cancer um i think one of the things that i really noticed was uh, a lot of people were fearful in in what to say they didn't know what to say to me when we're going through it and often um there was there was two connections i had with people either they'd say that and i i, I don't know what to say but i'm sending you my love support thoughts you know some days i just get love hearts and jenny was one of those people that would do that and you know there is sometimes no words to say but you still want to to have that connection the other was the the people that i had connected with with um they were also going through similar situations with a loved one with brain cancer and there was words such as i get it or i i i know what you're going through and i'm here for you and sometimes it's even hard to find the words of what you're going through or how confronting the the situation got um and it was hard to talk but there was moments where i did need to talk or or lean on my support network and and without them I, I hate to think how I would have done it without that connection and that authentic care that I had from my pharmacy friends from everyone from delivering the medicines you know um the people that came in they come in and give me a hug and you know all of those little connections as a whole had a huge impact on my palliative care journey as a carer but also <laughs> On my mum that knew that she was in good hands with all of these people that cared and were, were looking out for not only her but the whole family um and that gave her comfort for knowing that when she died similar to what jen said that everyone was going to look after each other and and no one was going to be left alone or or isolated once she did pass yeah thank you both for sharing those those personal stories those personal examples and again they just they point to the the impact we can all have as as humans and i think as as you've both said that that authenticness that is often inside us and we don't realize it and we just you know what you were saying there leah about you know people say i don't know what to say but 
but but just saying that you're acknowledging someone's experience and it's so so powerful so thank you both for for sharing that jenny if somebody wants to get involved in the powers program if a pharmacist wants to get involved what do they need to do so psa website the pharmaceutical society of australia website they just look into the education catalogue and they will find the loneliness program for psa members as leah mentioned earlier today it's free the training so we really encourage everyone to join this movement really giving a voice to loneliness um yeah leah that's the, the correct way the best way we'll yep. call leah <laughs> yep. Uh, yeah, reach out to us if you want to talk about your community or how we work with um, locally, if we want to connect, if we want to talk to these pilots. We've had so many people want to connect with us. Um, each one Jenny and I will go to, we will kind of co-design what's needed for that community or or what are the gaps or, or build on what they've already got going. Um, a lot of people have got some great initiatives that we can then, you know, ice and do it, do an extra special, you know, pilot or something like that. So, yeah, mm -hmm. reach out. We want to talk with people and, um, yeah, that would be great. I'll include links and contact details uh, in, in the show notes for this to make it uh, easy for people to get involved in, in the PALS program or, or get involved in that palliative care training that, that's that's coming up next year. Thank you so much for, for the work you're doing and, and making this time to, to share your wisdom and your work with us. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Leah. Thanks, Ian. Thank you. Thank you. Farmers Jenny Kirshner, founder of the PALS program, and Leah Robinson, project manager with the Pharmaceutical Society of Australia. Thanks so much for tuning in to Thursdays at 3, whether that's via PCA socials or Spotify and engaging in matters of life and death. You'll find more advice, tools and support at the Palliative Care Australia website, where you can also make a donation to support our work. Thanks for tuning in. Catch you next time.